recording this so this is the first time i've done that so it's on record so we're recording this webinar for anyone uh who would like to uh see this later or uh, uh who are unable to make it but thank you for all parents uh staff and uh, local advisory board members from beer park school who are, who are able to join us uh, this afternoon my name's mark greatrex i'm the chief executive of bellevue place education trust which is a group of eight schools uh, which uh, opened obviously Deer Park School in two, uh, September 2015, if I've uh, met you before, hello. Um, and I'm also joined today by Laura Gregory, Director of Education, and uh, by Alex Lee, who we're here to hear from. So welcome, Alex, and uh, thank you for your time for meeting uh, the parents um, uh, and staff and uh, advisors across Deer Park School. Um, it's a bit of a strange experience. Normally we would like to, as I said in my email, done this in person. Um, these unprecedented times means that we're looking to do this in a little bit of a different way uh, so that you get the opportunity to meet Alex in person, hear what, where, uh, his background and uh, we'll hear from him in a minute about what he, uh, why he applied to Deer Park School but also what we feel we, he can bring to Deer Park School. So we're, we're delighted he's to be with us. Just while we're waiting for the last few parents to join us um, at the moment, um, we, uh, I was just going to run through the format and just give a bit of an introduction for today's session. Um, the format, as we all know, is on Zoom. It's a webinar on Zoom where a number of you will be able to hopefully hear us. Um, what, after Alex has done a brief introduction, what we were hoping to run was a Q&A session. So if you move your mouse down at the bottom, you'll see the Q&A tab. And um, what we'd really like and encourage people to do is to be able to put some of their questions in that while they're speaking to Alex or listening to Alex or um, even now may have some questions they'd like to do. Laura will be able to help me hopefully and facilitate and put some of those questions either in a general form or rather specifically uh, to Alex so that we can uh, just get a bit of a feel of what, what he's about uh, and, and what he will be bringing to the school from the 1st September. In addition to that, if you also would like to ask questions, I know obviously the building is a significant issue at the moment, um, along with unfortunately temporary arrangements from September because of the lockdown situation has uh, meant the building is not going to be uh, coming as early as possible. We also have, um, delighted to say we have Francis and um, uh, Francis Bracegirdle online as well, and Stuart Dixon, our Chief Operating Officer, who we can bring into the panel element of this, and um, we can look to include them as well. So uh, um, if you are able to put your questions in, that's hopefully how we're going to try and make this an interactive session over the next half an hour or so. As I say, just to introduce, of course, I'm very grateful that you are able to uh, support us with a Deer Park School that has, it's a, a school on an interesting journey, of course. If you're a part of the 12, 13 parents who joined us uh, in September 2015, you'll know that uh, the school is continuing to grow as a school, um, expand with exciting, uh, exciting opportunities and also into the new building, which we are desperately looking forward to uh, going into on the 1st of September. Um, I want to send a special thank you as well to the staff that have joined us and the staff uh, that are, have worked over this period of time of the COVID-19 lockdown. It's been, a, it's been a challenge for the school to see this through, particularly where the government announcements are going at the moment. Um, I was delighted to visit the school a couple of uh, last week and see not only the great plans that have been put in place, particularly by Mrs. Brace Girdle and Mrs. Ms. Coward, but also the rest of the team, that children just look really happy, engaged, and very happy to be back. I know that some parents have been uh, very happy to send their children back. Um, hopefully soon we'll be able to put out plans. I know Mrs. Bracegirdle is working on this at the moment for uh, all children to get some uh, co uh, contact time before the end of term. That's certainly what we're focusing on at the moment. Um, but again, we can talk about that later because that's we're outside uh, of, of Alex's, uh, uh, Alex's area. So. Just coming on to, to Alex and the appointment process, we, we went through a process after Mrs. Colenso uh, left last academic year um, for making the appointment of the, uh, a new head teacher in March. And delighted to say Alex uh, accepted the role. Um, it was a process that I delegated the appointment of the head teacher alongside with a trustee who joined us. Um, Laura joined us as the director of education. We also had James uh, from the uh, the chair of the local advisory board and the local authority engagement as part of the process. So we're delighted to be able to do such a thorough process along with exercises with children around data and also meeting some parents and from the local advisory board. Um, we were really impressed with what Alex brought in, not only in terms of his, uh, his exciting background in education, but his academic record is absolutely excellent as well. And also his own CPD. So I, I hope he'll talk to you about the future leaders program he's been through and actually how he's been preparing himself 
for this role. But ultimately, we really, really had a lot of confidence in terms of the meeting the vision and the values of the organisation going forward. So uh, we were we were really impressed and really excited to be working with Alex and the team going forward. Um, and I have worked really hard in making sure that team will be as strong as possible. So uh, without any further ado, Alex, if I can uh, well introduce you, you know, welcome you to give a bit of an overview about yourself. I hope I haven't take, taken too much of your thunder there uh, at the moment, but if I can hand over to you, give a bit of background, then we'll do some Q&As after that, uh, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk through a little bit about my vision and focus for next year for Deer Park. Um, and before that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal history as well and what in particular attracted me to Deer Park and to the role. Um, my own personal history is I've predominantly, over the last sort of decade or so, worked in challenging schools. So in North London and East London with the last half decade spent in Hackney. And over the course of that, I've worked in a wide array of provisions from outstanding schools, from new starters, um, all the way to turnaround projects in need of radical change to serve their communities. And my own education before that is perhaps slightly more international. I did my undergraduate at the North Carolina University over in Chapel Hill, uh, and then my postgraduate at the University of Oxford with a, a year squeezed in between to go and play rugby in New Zealand. Um, so my experience is predominantly in providing for settings with deprivation and students who need very close personal care as well as a very strong standard of education. But that's the most dear to my heart process is that in radically reforming curriculum and educational processes in order to meet the needs of every child. And actually, it's being a resident of St Margaret's myself, one of the things that really attracted me about uh, Deer Park was its reputation within the community as one that really did serve the needs of every individual child and as an institution whose educational commitment went beyond the school gates. And actually, the parents that I spoke to and the members of the community I spoke to spoke quite profoundly about that, and that spoke volumes for me. And I certainly believe that school should be the nucleus of the community. So again, I would. Um, but actually that the incorporation of community idiosyncrasies, the localised history, its ethos, its perspective, that that should be a really core part of the school's decision making and direction. And part of the attraction for me with Deer Park was that it incorporated the values of the trust, which are those that I subscribe to myself from my own ethical background, but also to those of the local community which I really think actually serving the local values of the community is such an important part of the school, both for the children and families, but also for the direction of the staff members who work there. Um, and as the school grows and it moves, this is an opportunity to develop a truly exceptional provision for all the pupils in our community. And actually, one of the things that really appeals to me is that opportunity to grow a local school, which is the school of choice over state maintained or prep or independent school, not because it's, but because it's uh, of a reasonable proximity to anybody's home, but actually for the quality of educational development and personal development that goes on there. And that is an incredibly rare opportunity and that's what most excites me about Deer Park at the moment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my focus for next year, but before I do that I want to be clear that Deer Park at the moment is a school that's delivering an excellent provision for its pupils. Actually you know, the leaders and staff there have done a fantastic job and a documented job by Ofsted and others that actually this is a school that's working well and it's a school that's working for its pupils for their individual needs. And my focus for the coming year is not on systemic change or sweeping alterations. Actually, the core focus of the school for September and for this coming, coming academic year is developing and extending that high quality education. And actually, that, that's a high quality that the leaders and staff at Deer Park already have put into place. And it's on continuing to drive the high standards in both academic and cultural development as well. And obviously, I'm both delighted and grateful that Frances has agreed to stay on as part of that school's journey and for the work that she's put in this year. Um, so a couple of foci for me. So perhaps the most one that's dear to my heart to start with is the curriculum. So we'll be looking at actually the strength and breadth across the curriculum with a focus on the excellence of all subjects. So it used to be that schools taught long division and reading, and that was that. But actually, if for a school to be successful, it needs to prepare its pupils in order to make the most of their talents, opportunities for the diverse opportunities that the world around them represents. And doing that means that the curriculum should afford pupils the opportunity to speak with the rhetorical dexterity of artists when they're critiquing, to explore like historians, to be uh, with the financial savvy, say, of being able to recognize debt and credit and loan sharks. The school should be across the board somewhere where pupils are developing a range of interests and that they're able to articulate and oratorically deliver those interests to the best of their ability. And that's a really core cool focus for me. I know Ms. Coward's done some really strong work on the curriculum so far, and we're really excited to get that started in September. So for me, making sure that every subject has the same high quality of expectations that we would traditionally see in reading or writing or mathematics, that's a really core cool principle of what makes a strong school. 
The second for me is the personal and individual development of each child. So when we talk about school development, sometimes we tend to focus on the academic strata, whereas actually the cultural, musical, sporting, artistic side of school development is just as important. Actually making sure that there is an extended provision which caters for those opportunities for children is a crucial part of developing the whole child, I think. So we're going to focus next year on looking at how we extend what is already a strong provision to make sure that every child's talents, every child's interests, and every child's willingness to succeed in a variety of areas is met by the school. And that there's opportunity to do that and to cater for individual progress as well. In doing so, that means that a robust communication strategy with the community is almost essential, actually, to ensure that there's quality dialogue, because there's going to be a lot of change next year. We're moving into a new building. We don't yet know what September is going to look like from the government guidance. And actually, as the school expands and progresses, those little idiosyncrasies of the community and that strong, robust dialogue is going to be crucial as we grow and progress. So making sure that there is family and community engagement in the school's direction and in what's provided for pupils is extremely important for me. And in a moment, I'm going to hand back to Mark in a second for the Q&A. Um, but before I do so, I just want to say I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. I'll see you on the gate on, uh, on September 7th, and hopefully handshakes will be legal by then. Um, but we'll see. So please do stop and introduce yourselves, and please do make sure that we get to meet at the start of term. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much, Alex. We, um, uh, that's given us a really good overview, and actually some of the questions that we've started to come in already uh, has been really positive. And delighted that hopefully this format is working for a number of people. We've got 112 people online at the moment, so I, I do hope you're able to hear and, uh, and, and, and see what Alex is saying quite well. I've just, uh, as I say, I'm just going to go through a couple of the questions in order, if that's uh, of uh, what well, I think is quite, quite an interesting question. The first one actually comes in around the heart values, Alex, and you would have talked to her about the values around the, uh, the school uh, when, you, when you obviously came through the application process. I remember you talked about that uh, quite a bit. So I'm just going to read out with this question a little bit uh, uh, so that you can get a feel of uh, what this one's asking. If it's really around the heart values, which of the values do you think is most important? And for what you see, what do you think, where, where are you looking to add the most capacity around this? Or where do you feel that uh, a, a focus will be at the beginning? Uh, to maintain what's good and maybe improve in areas where you feel that actually we can further improve on uh, around the values. Interesting. Yeah, of course. I think that the, the values of, uh, of any school have the, the potential to be one of two things. Or it has the potential to actually form the heart of the school's curriculum. So the focus for me is going to be looking at how those values are incorporated into the actual learning and the actual experience of children every day. So if, for example, if we're looking at teaching and learning, how are those values incorporated into our lessons? And how are we making sure that we're manifesting those values in the way that we teach our children, the way that we expect them to conduct themselves, and the way that we expect them to experience education at Deer Park? So for me, I think values are only really valuable, if you like, if they're incorporated to every facet of the school life. It should be something that the school lives and breathes. So the first thing for me to look at in September is how we're incorporating that to our educational strata, how it manifests itself in the playground, whether we have leadership responsibilities that we are encouraged to take up, whether we are actually looking at the development of the whole child, whether we are actually looking at meeting those values in, on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, as well as giving them service in our newsletters and with our dialogue with the community. So to answer your question, the most important focus for me on value set is making sure that they're actually incorporated into the walk, if you like, of the daily life at Deer Park. Wonderful. Thank you. Laura, you've got to take the next one. Yes, there's another question that's come through, Alex. Um, obviously, Deer Park is due to have its first set of Upper Key Stage 2 children having moved through the school um, next year. Um, and parents have some questions around the secondary transition because they start to begin to think about it, obviously, in Year 5. So what are your thoughts? What's your experience around supporting parents and children? ahead of this change um, because it will be new and the first set of um, children to leave the school um, entering year five next year. Mm. Yeah, wonderful question. So I've been a year six teacher for excluding one year uh, my entire career. So my experience of children transitioning to secondary schools is relatively extensive by now. And for me, that there's three key facets of the way that you manage the transition to secondary schools. And the first one has to be personal well-being. It has to be developing an understanding with the children that actually the transfer to secondary school is an opportunity. It's actually something that is enacted for them in order to develop in a place that's going to be the best suited for them. And the second point uh, is information for parents. It has to be done in consultation and actually 
whether that's a selective entry process or whether it's going to a particular state school or a particular schools close by, that's got to be done in consultation with the child and with the family what's best for the child because actually what's best for the individual child varies enormously so a really important part for that for me is the information that's developed to parents and the information that's disseminated and the way that actually we look at how do we explore what's right for each child and when we've done that and actually this process if i'm honest doesn't really start in year six it starts in year five we're looking at what those that child's particular interests are how they're developing and what would be the best place best place for them to foster those interests and, and the place that's going to take care of them best and to do that, we need to start that consultation period in year five. And then when we get into year six, obviously we have um, academic progress is ramped up in year six. And we then start during the summer term, we start to look at actually the transitions there. And we start to look from a PSHE perspective, we start to look at difficult changes or making difficult decisions or dealing with new environments. And having a robust curriculum in school is really important to do that. But the third point for me there is that it's the continuing support. And actually the parental support has to run from by all the way through to the end of year six and then in some cases through the summer because that transition for some pupils can be a very breezy and easy movement into secondary school for some pupils it's not and actually that support does need to be in place to ensure that they have a base of home security in somewhere that they are welcomed and trusted in order to voice those views and those concerns and part of that's done in the curriculum but actually part of it's done in the personal and social side of school of having trusted adults to talk to of having people on site who are both knowledgeable and available and able to pass orally care for children as they make that transition. Great, thank you very much. And I think, Alex, you, you do quite a lot of that at the moment within, uh, within the current school, don't you? So I think it's, uh, it's invaluable children being supported through that process because it is a big change for them when they go on to the secondary school. Um, just a little change of thread. What a question we had here is around uh, your vision for SEN children uh, at the school and how you plan to implement it. And of course, as I think you're aware, is we've got a fantastic new uh, special education needs coordinator coming into the school uh, who started, uh, Mrs. Ed, who started uh, at the moment. Really, what's your vision around SEM? Excellent. Well, I'm well aware, obviously, that Lisa has an excellent handle on SEM um, and that she's obviously an extremely capable SEM leader. Yeah. The fundamental principle for SEN for me is that the same expectations of progress and personal care should be applied to all people, whether that means people with special educational needs or not, and that actually that SEN isn't viewed as a title where pupils are viewed as less able to perform. I think that that's both a defunct and wrong statement to make, and that actually pupils with special educational needs should actually have the individual criteria that they need in place in order to exceed. And actually, that's the job of the school, to make sure that all individual pupils, regardless of background, creed, ethnicity, or individual need, have that capacity to achieve. So the real focus for me to start with is getting to know the individual children, because it's impossible to structure an SEN program around a concept. It's very difficult to structure it around a broad vagary. Actually, SEND programs need to be structured around the needs of the individual children and they need to be structured around the particular semantics that those children need in order to succeed. And it's making sure that we have extremely high expectations of them in line with their peers, and that we are providing all the support that they need in order to meet those high expectations. Thank you. And like, like everything you've said, Alex, um, it's kind of getting your feet under the table at Deer Park to, to see the practice more so in action as well, especially around special educational needs and the conversations that you've been having with the staff team to support you in formulating some of those judgments um, and ideas that you have. So um, I'm gonna merge a couple of questions together and um, it's about parents um, and I can really resonate with one of them, um, being a parent that's homeschooling myself at home um, at the moment. It's obviously parents have become teachers in their own right at home so what are your thoughts on how um, we can work together in the future to make home learning something that adds true value to the family and community, but also merge with that is that um, there's a substantial number of parents that are really engaged um, and wanting to give more to the school. So how, how would you, how do you envisage potentially pulling in the parents, but also mixing that with the experience they're having of having become teachers over the last two months at home? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to take that question in two parts, if yeah, that's okay. So the first one, when we're talking about home learning and making that meaningful, first part is that home learning needs to be something other than a token gesture. I think that if home learning is going to be effective, it has to be in line with what's happening at school. It has to be well-informed and it has to have a clear direction. So 
we have tools at our disposal now, obviously, which make actually that process much easier that really facilitate the learning at home. And being able to do that through Zoom or through Google Classroom, you know, a wide variety of technological processes that make education accessible at home, what we need to do is we need to ensure that that's aligned with what's going on in school. So we teach a very particular curriculum, right? And we need to make sure that, for example, the strategy that we're using for column addition or long division or interpreting an authorial dialogue is manifested in the same way at home. And the way to do that is by making sure that everyone's on the same page. So information for me is key. Communication is key in order to make sure that home learning runs alongside school learning. The second part of that has to be trust, is that there must be trust between the school and at home, that there is high quality education firstly taking place at school, but also that parents are supporting that at home. And there has to be trust in the dialogue that takes place between the two, where teachers and leaders are able to talk to parents about how their child is doing in school and how they can support that at home. And also vice versa, when parents are saying, I'm seeing this from my child at home, or I've experienced this, or I've talked to my child about this, or I've noticed that in this particular area, she might need some more support. The teachers and leaders listen to that and that that's fed back into their curriculum at school as well. I think home learning is meaningful when it runs alongside what's happening in school and when it is in conjunction with what's happening in school. So the most important part of that for me is making sure that everybody understands the purpose and everybody understands the logistics. So if we're using Google Classroom, that we have training for parents, that we invite them in for training sessions or parental workshops, that we make sure that when we have curriculum workshops, we clearly have that curriculum supported at home. That when we have, like say, visiting speakers into school, that we invite parents in to be a part of that as well. So the education process that they can support from home isn't closed off. It's very much an open, transparent system so that how to support your child at home becomes more and more evident because actually you're part of the process. Oof. The second part for me is, actually, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question again because I forgot the second <laughs> part. Um, with, um, so you've talked about homeschooling and how you, how you can and develop that. The other one is about this parent engagement. You've got a whole host of parents, a whole community of parents that attend Deer Park with another 60 due to start in September um, and they want to be involved more. So how can you involve the parents more with um, their child's education? Deer Park. Okay, so parental communication strategies are essentially bound around how much is there an opportunity to communicate with your teacher, right? So the first part is, for me, is accessibility. So are your teachers accessible? Are the parents able to talk to their teachers, to their leaders, to the head teacher about what education their child is doing? There's also another part for that for me is that recognizing that in our community, we have a high level of expertise and a very diverse range of subjects, and that actually that expertise and that experience of a wider skill set, that experience of the wider world, does have a place in community education. And if a school is at the heart of the community, then if we are looking at our parents' diversity of experience and skill set, inviting parents in to talk to classes, inviting parents in to share their experiences, and not just inviting parents into the school where they can take part in a workshop where the school informs them, but actually vice versa as well. And really engaging parents in that decision-making process and their own experiences, and having, giving them a, an opportunity to shape the curriculum and the foundations of the delivery in school for their child. The other part of that for me is it's got to be centralized around the events of the school. And I think that things like, for example, sports days or winter fairs or parent-teacher conferences can become cliched almost in the school calendar, but those are vital events actually for manifesting the community feel. And they're vital events for children in terms of their parents and their teachers communicating on the same page. And I'm well aware that Deer Park already has a wonderful PTA, but supporting those events and making sure that the running of the school, that the achievements of the school are open and transparent to parents and that they are able to not just experience but also be a part of the running of those events is a really important thing for me to make sure that actually the school is based on the strength of its community and I'm well aware this is a community with some considerable strengths so incorporating that is both important for me and what's more importantly important for the children. Yeah okay, great thank you Alex on that. Um, Sorry to carry on bombarding you. We've got some really, really good questions coming through, and actually three of them that I'm just going to put together around the um, uh, around the uh, the black the black movement at the moment, around the BME movement, and obviously in the school that you work and the context, it's about how we uh, make sure that's part of the curriculum. That diversity is a key part of what the school is uh, looking to promote, and making sure that it is accessible, uh, but also that children are educated about the. The, the various elements of, uh, of this part through the curriculum, be it through Black History Month or other areas around there. And the question really is how, how do you 
how, how, what would be your plans of ensuring that diversity is key in part of the curriculum um, and that actually that the whole the diversity agenda is included very strongly as part of what is delivered through the school's programme? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the diversity agenda extends you know, beyond the, the BAME community, extends beyond the Black Lives Matter movement. Actually, we're talking about a, a wide range of community demographics that have a right to be included, that have a right to be recorded in school curricula. And whether we're talking about gender or sexuality, whether we're talking about race or ethnicity, the core focus of the curriculum, and especially for the PSHE curriculum, needs to be on celebrating that diversity and its strengths. So part of that for me is openness. So being able to talk to children in a lens where we help them to understand the processes that are taking place at the moment, not just to understand the reaction, what they're seeing around them, but actually to understand the history behind it, to understand the emotional volatility that stems over decades of racial injustice or prejudice or discrimination, and helping them to understand from an objective standpoint, looking at how these changes have come to pass, and then looking at periods of history where actually radical change has been informed and how that's been done. But from the PSHE standpoint, I think actually this is not something that should be confined to year five and year six. This is something that runs from reception all the way through, is that we make sure that within our curriculum, we are celebrating figures from across a wide range of diversity, from a wide range of genders and sexualities, and that we are making sure that actually when we look at particularly influential figures in history, that we are actually looking at Jesse Owens and Frida Kahlo and Martin Luther King, that we're making sure that we're incorporating Mae Jemison to make sure that we've gone from Mary Curie all the way up to Gandhi. And that actually that we make sure that children understand that race and creed has no bearing on your ability to make a profound impact upon the people around you. And part of that is in the delivery in the curriculum. And part of that is in the values that we deliver at school. Some of that's done through assemblies, making sure that when we get the children together, we talk about difficult issues and that we talk about issues which are some, sometimes make us uncomfortable. And that we talk about those with openness and honesty and that we support the children in their understanding and their ability to manifest the values that we say are so important. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I know you've, you've talked a bit about your vision for the curriculum and continuing the work that um, Victoria and Francis have put into to, um, the shaping it this year. There's just a couple of questions I'm going to merge again. Sorry, it's a double question. So um, you've got quite a sporting background um, and you've got a passion for sport. But it's thinking about with, with the move to the new premises, the new site, what is your vision for sport? Because at the moment it's, it can be quite limited and it is very limited because of the space available for the staff and the children. So what could it potentially look like for the families, for the children when you're um, in the brand new building? And when you talked about the curriculum, um, you talked about many different areas, the arts, the histories and the sport. And will this require more resources per, per pupil? Um, linked to your vision. Hmm. Okay, so for the first part, for what sport could look like. So the first part for me is encouraging a wide range of sport. So to make sure that when we have, look at our extended day provision, when we're looking at our PE curriculum, that pupils are able to participate, not just in team sports, but in individual sports as well. And then when we're thinking about what's the provision for pupils to actually interact in a team that we have each year group running each week to make sure that our pupils are learning, not just to play the sport, but learning sportsmanship as well and learning to play together, compete against other schools, hopefully winning, but being able to play in a competitive environment and develop that healthy competition while also enjoying sport. And I know that certainly it was formative for me, I'm aware that it is for many people, but actually being able to take that opportunity to really develop your own interests. And I think sport is certainly a valid interest at this age. I think it's a valid interest at any age, but people should have that opportunity to play in a team at their school, to compete against others and to develop their own individual skill set. Um, I think that extending that into the extended day for clubs after school, for teams after school, is an extremely important part of any school's wraparound provision. But that also needs to tie in with the PE curriculum to make sure that as we, we move into this wonderful new building with extended outside space, the multiple use games area is going to mean that actually we can play football and hockey and basketball and we can actually experience a wide range of across the different terms. I mean that actually we should be able to teach pupils over the course of the same year a push pass in hockey and a sprint start over the summer term. And actually they're developing an opportunity to select the sporting areas where they feel that they are really valued and they feel that they can really contribute. But it, we also have to say in mind that actually it's okay for people not to particularly be engaged in sport. And we want to make sure that we also focus on the health side of exercise to make sure that actually activity and endorphin release, frankly, 
are really important parts of leading an active lifestyle and that we develop that mentality in our children as well and we help them to understand the importance of even if team games aren't for them but actually there is an importance as well to leading that healthy active lifestyle and, and the productivity and the benefits that that affords them in terms of resources you know the short answer for uh, will a new curriculum and actually when we're looking at if we're developing uh, let's say art in particular will that need more resources yes is the short answer um, but actually it's a little bit more than that and it's a little bit more nuanced because actually the development of a really strong art curriculum isn't just about painting it's not just about being able to handle charcoal with different um, let's say levels of durability or different pencil grips actually it's about being able to talk like an artist it's about being able to use the oratorical dexterity to be able to critique a painting or look at a painting and say that's matisse rather than hop or i can tell that actually this is mondrian and not van gogh and actually enabling our children to take an active interest in art is a real part of that curriculum and actually that's not resources that's subject knowledge and enabling our teachers and supporting our teachers to deliver that high quality experience of the arts as well as practical skills is what makes a really strong curriculum Mm -hmm. So there's that double cost, isn't there, of um, staff development, develop, developing their subject knowledge, as well as the practical resources for the pupils as well. And just to say um, that we have many BPEP Trust sporting events um, that Deer Park also were involved in. So um, we look forward to seeing more teams um, and more competitions as, a, as across the Trust. I'm just going to throw in another quick, quick question. Um, what's your favourite children's book, Alex? Ooh, uh, recently it's um, Rosie Revere, Engineer, I'd say. Um, firstly, because my daughter's just coming to that age where I'm not sure she appreciates rhyming couplets yet. She certainly likes being read to and she likes the illustrations. I think 17 months is a little old to appreciate poetic meter. Um, a little young. Uh, but actually, I think it's a, it's a wonderful book about Firstly, you know, it's, it's great for aspirations, it's great for STEM, it's great for you know, motivational looks at what the benefits are of failure, but also it's a really fun book to read. And I really like the illustrations and she seems to too, which makes it my favorite. Um, until recently, it was Look Up, um, which is about uh, a little girl who I think is based on Mae Jemison. Um, and it's about a little girl who wants to go and see a meteor shower and dragging her older brother off his cell phone to take her to the park. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for nicking that question, Laura. Uh, and uh, nice one. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So if people are happy to stay on just for a couple of minutes, I think I've got two more questions I'd just like to cover. One's actually Alex and one actually Oldfield, which is around the temporary school location moving forward. Um, but the last one really is for you, Alex, that we'll probably finish on if that's OK. And it's, uh, it's around really, and obviously you're doing this in your current school, around the disruption of lockdown. And uh, what disruption has been caused by lockdown, I think, in increasingly as we move forward, not only will you not be in a new building on the 1st of September, I think it looks like we're going to be having the vestiges of the lockdown coming through in terms of children coming back, possibly for the first time without social distancing on the 1st of September. Um, just want to have your thoughts really around what you feel the disruption will be caused through learning and actually the thinking you've you've been doing already in terms of actually how to emotionally engage children back into the school environment but also around ensuring that the curriculum coverage is uh, is is managed i remember having a conversation with francis about that last week it is going to be a bit of a challenge but just wanted to know about your thoughts and and how you're planning to support the school through as i say not just a lockdown but also being on the temporary premises just that little bit longer yeah, of course. I think emotionally is the key word there, because actually pastoral well-being coming out of what I'm reasonably sick of hearing referred to as unprecedented times, but yeah. shall we say challenging times. Uh, actually making sure that the pastoral well-being for the children is the priority there, that actually you know, these are incredibly difficult times for them as well. And that whilst it's, you know, it's scary and difficult and unprecedented for adults, that they're experiencing a level which they haven't ever seen before. And these are difficult things to have to deal with. There are messages coming through on the news, on social media that they'll be seeing that perhaps they don't fully understand. So making sure that when we bring them back into school, if they're in new routines, that they clearly understand the purpose of those. And that we dedicate time to making sure that we talk about these issues, dedicate time to making sure that children have the scope to talk to trusted adults about these issues. On the curriculum side, it's, uh, it's going to have to be a bespoke curriculum. I mean, the, the you know, the simple fact is that any school should actually transform its curriculum around the individual needs of its pupils and that strong educational provision looks like individualized tailored learning opportunities and that's not going to be as uh, any changes there in september it's going to have to be what if you look, listen to michael wilshire what he's calling a recovery curriculum 
that actually, you know, this needs to bear in mind that we can't just plow on from the end of the last academic year. Okay. The children individual starting points, and we have to consider that some children will have been learning very effectively during this time, some might not have had the opportunity to do that, and that we need to take each child on an individual case basis and make sure that they're being provided for in a way that brings them on from their formal education from March, the experiences they've had since, but allows them to then access a new curriculum. In terms of the structure of the school day, you know, that might look like intervention groups in the afternoon, it might look like additional tutoring groups, it might look like additional home learning and supporting that process as well. But actually making sure that we're structuring around the needs of the individual child rather than just looking to the curriculum document is going to be all important. Great, thank you very much. Uh, that's re really, really helpful to hear that. Uh, as I say, we haven't been able to quite answer all of the questions and hopefully we can try and find a way of getting some of the answers back, uh, but just conscious of time. Um, the final point I just wanted to run through, and Alex, I, what, what we haven't included is a lot of the welcome, Alex, and looking forward to meet you comments as well. So there's been a lot of that. So thank you very much for giving that overview and answering those questions in your time while still doing another role. It's been really insightful and really good to hear from you talking that way. Um, the, the last point I just wanted to ask, because it's more of a question for us to answer at the moment, is we just had a couple of logistical questions. I, I was going to bring Stuart in, but it's quite a, it's quite a, a, a smaller question I can answer at the moment um, because I, I'm aware of the answer for it. It's just that traditionally Deer Park has been taking on 30 children a year while we've been in temporary uh, accommodation. We are taking 60 on. Uh, we take 60 on for the first time in reception this year. We are actually going to be um, uh, continuing with 60 children that have uh, applied for next September. Uh, the thinking of that is that we are expecting the building to become available towards the back end of the autumn term. Um, we have secured, I'm delighted to say, secured further temporary space for the school. And actually, this is going to be in the business centre of the FE College. We're just agreeing a great agreements before we can fully give all the details of that, uh, where we will have a passage and a walkthrough that connects us to the school. So we feel we have got, and, um, and Francis, and I've got to thank Francis and Stuart for working with the ESFA on this, and to get this wonderful with the current site, so that we we have the accommodation to stay on the site for that little bit longer, um, and then when we get a little bit more uh, of a firmer idea of when the building will be coming through, we will be able to um, start to d develop plans. I've got to say, moving in over Christmas is not the ideal. We've done it in a school moving in over half term. Uh, which has been possible in the past uh, with all hands to the pump really, uh, but we can do that. But we have secured ad additional space uh, for next year. Um, but as I say, Alex, you'll be joining the school um, in, in the temporary accommodation. I think that'll be good for you to see, but also will obviously be part of the journey of moving over to the new building. So thank you for ev so much for all parents uh, and, and staff and the engagement uh, for time for this session. As I say, it's not how we would normally like to have done it, um, the one thing I also wanted to leave you up as we wrap up, not only thanking everyone again um, uh, for what they're doing around the uh, reopening of school around the COVID situation, particularly the staff. It's been an absolute phenomenal job. We have also got a parent survey out that I think it'd be a bit remiss of me not to mention if you are able to respond to that. Uh, not necessarily about this webinar, obviously about the experience, because we are trying to catch your thoughts and views around the school going forward. But of course, what you've experienced up till March, we were running pretty well up till then. So uh just want to bring it to a close on that point and thank everyone for their time and their engagement thank you, alex thank you laura for helping me out with the questions and uh hopefully look forward to meeting you all again thank you for your time for this afternoon this evening take care bye to thank dido and her team so thank